Thanks a lot. Thanks for uh, having me, uh, Ed Williams. I, I wore purple uh, for the occasion. <laughs> Uh, I want to tell you uh, uh, about a, uh, a series of questions that I've been uh, interested in uh, that uh, basically uh, combine uh, mathematics, combinatorics specifically, uh, to the study of problems uh, in the social sciences. Uh, but let me first start off with uh, a game. Um, there's this game called Hex, which is played on a, a board with hexagonal tiles. and uh, it's uh, a very simple uh, game, so you have basically um, a, a white player and a black player, and the idea, if you're one of these players, is to form a chain of, of, uh, of markers across the board, one way or the other. So, for instance, white might go from this direction to this direction, black may go from this direction to this direction. Okay? How many people have seen this game before? Okay, it's, uh, it was a, a game that was uh, invented in the 1940s. Parker Brothers actually made a real game out of it in the 1950s, and that's what you're looking at. It was studied by John Nash, who we'll say more about. And uh, so one of the first questions you might ask if you start playing this game, you could play this game. Uh, drawing the board is a little complicated, but uh, once you draw the board, uh, the idea then is if your X to go from the X side to the X side with a chain of Xs, or the O side to the O side with a chain of O's. And so now one of the first questions you ask yourself is, must this game always have a winner? Or is it possible through some combination of X's and O's to end in a draw? That is, there's no chain from the X to the X side or the O to the O side. There's a question. What do you think? Is it possible in this game to end in a draw? How many people say, just your gut reaction, how many people say yes? And we will say no. Oh, okay. Okay, there's a little bit of uh, disagreement here. Uh, if, if you think uh, the, the answer is obvious, think about a huge board, which might be instead of five by five, 100 by 100. Okay, and then maybe the answer is not so clear. Okay, uh, if you get bored at any point during the talk, think about this game. Um, the starting point for the set of questions I want to talk about actually came to me in graduate school. So I was sitting um, with a friend of mine, and he said he, he just moved into a house, he and his three roommates. And the house had many different rooms, and the rooms had different features. You know, one was really large, but it was really noisy because it was next to the, the street. And another was, um, was really small, but it was quiet. Another was next to the kitchen. And so he asked me, he said, is there always a way to price the rooms in such a way that each person would choose a different room? There's a question. In other words, is there always a way to split the rent fairly? And so that's, uh, that's the starting uh, question for us today. Is there always a rental harmony, a way to harmonize people's preferences uh, to make everybody happy? And this is part of a larger set of questions, which is, um, what you might hear in some circles is, is, as a problem of fair division. How do you divide some object fairly among several people? Okay, um, This is uh, certainly an age-old problem studied since uh, antiquity, right? Maybe, uh, uh, you know, ever since, since uh, you know, early times, people wanted to divide things among several people, right? And so, um, it, it's probably first mentioned uh, in uh, the literature, in the academic literature, by Steinhaus, who's a mathematician, but this was an econometrica paper. Okay, so this is published in one of the top journals of economics. How do you divide a cake fairly? So just think a little bit about that. How do you divide? Do you, do you guys know a way to divide a cake fairly? Yeah. Um, Okay, this is a well-known procedure. One cuts, the other chooses, right? And why is that fair? Someone else? What does that make? Why is that fair? Yes. The person cutting the cake will want to make sure that they get as big a piece as possible, and in, mm -hmm. order, to, in order to make sure that's the case, they'll have to cut them all as close to evenly sized as they can. Okay, so um, how many people here have, have uh, tried this or done this method? One cuts, the other chooses? Yes, it's a, it's a pretty common. Uh, procedure, you might ask yourself, how do you come up with a fair procedure for more than two people? Okay, so that's a very, that's a very um, uh, important question. 
So there's lots of, lots of things to make precise here. It's one of the things that makes math really wonderful is that math gives us lang a language and tools to, to uh, make certain words precise and then study those questions, right? So we have to make all these words precise. What do you mean by cake, cut, fair, and, and how? So if you think about cake, well, there's many different kinds of cake. You could be dividing something you desire, that's like cake, or you could be dividing something that's bad, so good versus bad. It's something you don't desire, like rent. You don't want more rent, right? Okay? Uh, you could be talking about divisible goods, like if I'm dividing money or if I'm dividing time, those are infinitely divisible. Or you could be dividing indivisible goods, like if, if I'm getting a divorce from someone and I'm dividing the, the, the sofa and the stereo, these are indivisible. Okay? You might be dividing mixtures of those things too, actually, right? So uh, in a divorce settlement, normally, you know, some things are indivisible, like the stereo and the sofa, but then you mediate that division using money, right? Maybe I can't get, you either get all the sofa or no, none of the sofa, but you pay the other person for um, the privilege of getting the whole thing. <coughs> okay, so lots of different things you could be dividing here. What does it mean to cut? Well, you know, if I'm cutting cake, one way to think about cutting cake is, is moving a knife over the cake and, and making cuts, right? Parallel knives. But there's lots of other ways I could think about dividing a cake. You know, the, the problem of dividing a pie, you're sort of dividing by wedges. Um, if I'm dividing um, other kinds of things, there might only be certain kinds of cuts that are allowed, right? Maybe the sofa has to go with the love seat. Okay. All right. Um, and then there's lots of notions of fairness, right? So one notion of fairness is if I, there are n people, I just, uh, if I want to guarantee that each person gets at least one over n of the cake, that's called a proportional division, okay? That's uh, not as strong as an NB-free division, which is, in a, it, it, which is, I believe that I get the most cake in my measure, okay? What makes this interesting, of course, is that different people have different measures, right? You, what's your name? Lily. Lily. Lily might have a different measure, notion of what she thinks is important on a cake than Will. Will, right? Lily might like the cherries on the cake, and Will might just like the total volume of cake, okay? Because he's hungry. Um, and so whatever that, those measures are, in fact, that's what mathematicians do. They think about these things in terms of what are called measures. Uh, the uh, NB Free says, let me get the biggest piece in my own measure. Okay, can you see why that's a little stronger than proportional? Because if you get less than one over N in your measure, someone else will get one over N, and you will feel someone else gets one over N, more than one over N, right? And therefore you would envy them. Uh, but uh, to be envy free is, is a lot stronger than proportional. For the for two people, it's the same, right? So the I cut you choose uh, procedure, you see that those are the same. There are a couple of other notions which I won't talk about much here. Equitability, everyone believes they get exactly the same in their own measure. Efficiency, Pareto optimality is what it's often called in economics. Uh, there's no division that th where everybody does uh, at least as uh, so an efficient division is one in which no other uh, division dominates, which means that to dominate means that there's a division where everybody does at least as good and one does better. Okay, okay we're gonna talk about MV free. So are there procedures for finding a fair division? This is the question of how. We've already talked about two people, very famous uh, method, I cut, you choose. Uh, there is a, a more complicated three-person procedure um, and usually the way cake cutting algorithms go, that there's a division into what are called continuous <coughs> procedures and discrete procedures. So a continuous uh, procedure is the moving knife procedure where it, it goes something like this. Here's my cake, and I'm gonna move my, my knives over the cake in a certain way, and, and you're just watching me very closely as I move my knives, and you say, cut, and we make a cut. Continuous type procedure. If you ask me later, I can tell you what uh, these moving knife procedures look like. But they're kind of complicated, even for three people. That's the that's the message, the upshot. Okay. Um, the discrete version. This is a Selfridge-Conway procedure. 
uh, is one where it's a discrete procedure, like, okay, A cuts into some, some way, B, person B looks at it and does something, and person C does something, and there's some, some procedure, okay? Um, I cut you choose is very, very simple for two, but for three, it's, it's really, I'm kind of tempted as to whether I should show you what the three person is, but it might be an aside. Uh, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, show you how, I'll show you how it goes. So here's, here's a three person procedure. You imagine there are three people, A, B, and C. You imagine there are three people, A, B, and C. I think he's suggesting yes. trying to swiveling out. Uh, Oh, okay. I got to move the remote. That's fun. Great. Does that automatically move? Whoa. <laughs> that's great. If you hit the red button, it gives you a lecture for you. <laughs> that's great. It's even better. Okay, so three-person procedure goes something like this. Okay, so remember, Alice, Bob, and Carlos have, have different preferences, okay? So Alice is going to cut into what she thinks are thirds. Okay, so she might cut like this because she, she thinks these are, you know, there's some cherries here which look like sigmas. <laughs> um, these are equivalent to her. Okay, so in brackets are things that only she knows. Only she because she's, she's uh, these are her private preferences. Okay, but everybody agrees she gets to do the first cut. That's the way this procedure goes. Uh, and then um, Bob comes along and takes a look and says, I don't think these are the same size. I mean, Bob is interested in just sheer, sheer volume, okay? So Bob takes a look and says, this and these are the two largest, yes? And so Bob is going to trim uh, the one of the two largest so that there's a two-way tie for largest in Bob's measure. Are you with me? Uh, let's see, Bob trims to make a two-way tie for largest. Again, this is what's in his mind. The ref a referee will, will just verify that they're doing these things. Okay, Okay. now what? Hmm. Oh, let's just review. What does Alice now believe, once the trimmings are set aside, what does Alice now believe about these three pieces? She thinks this one is smaller than these two, correct? Bob thinks these two are the biggest, yes? Okay, good. So then we'll ask Carlos to do something. Maybe Carlos then chooses one of the pieces, okay? So at C chooses, and then what do we do? Well, no matter what C chooses, would you agree that Bob will have a choice of one of his two largest? So we'll just demand that Bob takes the trimmed piece if Char Carlos did it, right? So then Bob, and he's, he's required to take the trim if, po if, if possible. The trim piece, right? All right, and now um, Alice, because Bob or Charlie chose this piece, Alice gets one of these two. Okay. All right, so great, we just divided the cake fairly, except for what? The trimmings, oh my gosh, we got the trimmings to deal with. What do we do next? Yeah, you could do the same thing. The problem is if you keep iterating, you'll, it'll, this procedure will never end, okay? But I, I claim you know something about the trim piece you don't know about the whole thing. Namely, that uh, Bob, let's see, what do we know about the trimmed piece? Alice will never envy, um, let's see, what do we know about the trimmed piece? We know that the trimmed piece, if it goes back to Bob, Alice won't mind. Correct? Okay. So that, that suggests some order that we can use. Um, so if T is a person who got the trimmed piece, Um, and there's Alice, and then N is the other person. So there are three players now. I'll just rename them. Alice, N, and uh, the first person. Then you can have, um, let's see, this means that you can have V 
the uh, Alice choose after the person who gets who got the trimmed piece, right? And then n, um, that's what you have do. So now you just have n divide into thirds. That's these are n thinks all three of these are equal. Then you have t choose, and then you have Alice choose. And by the time both of these are, have been chosen, n still has what they think is a third of the trimmings. Okay. Whew, oh my gosh. That was hard for three people. Yes? Even, uh, even um, uh, then you might ask, what about more than three people? So uh, one question you might ask then is, what about an n-person procedure? And only in 1995 did someone, did a couple of people, uh, mathematician and political scientist come up with an n-person, nv-free procedure. Um, the crazy thing about this is it actually was, it, it's a finite procedure, but it's unbounded, meaning you could find a set of four people whose preferences are so crazy. So if you give me any number, like a billion, this procedure will take more than a billion steps for some set of four crazy preferences. So that was, it was a sort of a, a big open question then whether there was a bounded procedure. And only recently, I mean in the last two years, has uh, actually that question been answered. So there is now a bounded procedure due to Aziz and McKenzie. Okay, so what am I saying? What I'm saying is envy freeness is hard. The problem is hard. And what I want to tell you is sort of an interesting route to try to answer this question in a slightly different way using... Um, uh, topology, which you can think of as the study of continuous um, uh, functions, uh, and combinatorics. And so I want to just give you a little bit of a sense of, of how that goes. So the, the basic idea here is if I have some collection of possible divisions, I think of that as some kind of geometric space, okay, in some way, whatever that is. We'll talk about what that is in a minute. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to break the space into lots of pieces, and I'm going to label certain things in this space by preferences. Right? I like piece one, I like piece two, I like piece three. Uh, and then I'm going to use these labels to find a solution. Okay? And, uh, and so what, what an advantage of this kind of uh, procedure is that it's not going to do some funny things where you end up cutting the cake into bazillion pieces just to get four people happy, okay? It'll only require three cuts for four people or n minus one cuts for n people, okay? Um, the trade-off is it's gonna give approximate solutions, okay? So you, you're, you allow people to be happy up to epsilon. Okay, so here's the, the main star of this talk is this theorem called Sperner's Law, okay? So I'd like you, uh, if you can, to draw a picture of uh, a triangle, and uh, let me, you, you can do this in any way you want, but basically break, take a big triangle and break it up into lots of little triangles. It doesn't have to be as nice looking as the one I have. It could be kind of irregular if you want. But the only requirement is that the triangles all have to meet on a complete edge, right? You, th you're not allowed to do this. This is not allowed where this is part of an edge of the, the big thing. This is not allowed. OK? They have to meet on a complete edge or just at a vertex. Okay? This is what's called a triangulation. <coughs> Sperner's lemma says something interesting about a triangulation of a triangle. So if you, if you just draw yourself a, a big triangle broken up into lots of little triangles like this, uh, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to label the corners by 1, 2, and 3. Okay. And now all along the, so all these, these, these dots, which I'll call vertices, on the 1, 3 side, I'm only allowed to label them 1 or 3. So for instance, I could label them both 1 if I wanted to. Uh, along the 2, 3 set side, I allow 2s or 3s, yes? And then along this side, I allow 1s or 2s. Just for fun, I'll put another one in here, yes? 
And then on the inside, you allow, um, on the inside, you allow uh, ones, twos, or threes. So like this, one, two, two. All right? Any way you want. All right. Now, the surprise is, if you do something like this, it's called a Sperner labeling, then um, there's an interesting result that no matter how you've done it, there has to be a baby one, two, three triangle somewhere in your picture. Take a look at your picture and verify. Has to be a baby one, two, three triangle. Do you see one in my picture here? So ones are twos, ones are threes, twos are threes, yes? Inside one, two, or three, do you see one? Yeah, in fact, there are three of them. And in fact, the stronger conclusion of Sparta's Lama is that there is an odd number, okay? And in particular, an odd number is never zero, right? So there must be a one, two, three triangle, okay? Huh, okay, so you might be thinking, first of all, what does this have to do with uh, rent? Uh, and then, of course, another question is, why is this true? I hope, hope everybody, how many people have you, those of you who've drawn, Picture. Did you all did you all produce a, an odd number of triangles in your picture? Yes. Sorry, what dictates the ones in the middle? Anything. One, two, or three. Okay. Mm. Okay. Why is this true? Any ideas? Let's see. Um, well, there are actually a bazillion different proofs of this, which shows you that something interesting is happening. I'm just going to show you a couple of different proofs. So here's, a, here's one proof. Uh, think of this as a house with many rooms. Okay, so I like this version of the, the argument. Ooh. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, sh I'll have you think about that in a minute. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you why Square Islam is interesting. Um, one of the reasons it's interesting is that it actually uh, gives the elementary proof of a famous theorem in topology known as the Brouwer fixed point theorem. Okay, so the Brouwer fixed point theorem says a continuous function from a ball to itself has a fixed point. And if you don't know what continuous means, just think of something that doesn't have any tears or breaks. Okay, so for instance, if I take this cup of coffee and I slosh it around, that is moving nearby points to nearby points, yes? That's a continuous function of the coffee to itself. Are you with me? Okay. And what the Brouwer fixed point theorem says is if you have an object like this coffee, which is a ball, okay, what's a ball? A ball is something that doesn't have any internal holes. Okay? So this coffee has no internal holes, yes. Uh, and if I slosh it around, so I take a picture of it before and I take a picture of it after. There's going to be a point in the coffee that's in exactly the same place, as long as I slosh it continuously. Are you with me? That's a surprise. Um, here's another version. Uh, if I take a picture, a map of Williamstown, uh, and I crumple it and throw it somewhere in Williamstown, there must be a point in the map that's above, exactly above the point it represents. Well, no matter where I throw it. Now, of course, if I tear this map and throw East Williamstown into West Williamstown and West into East, there won't be a point above the point it represents. So continuity is important. I can only crumple, I can't tear. I can stretch, but I can't tear. Okay. Um, here's another version of the theorem. If I uh, have a bunch of fish that are swimming around, you can think of the fish as swimming continuously, right? Nearby fish are pointed in nearby directions, yes? So if I take my hand and I slap it against the side of the aquarium, all the fish are going to dart off. But they're going to dart, assuming they dart off continuously, like they're looking at their neighbors and darting in similar directions, uh, the claim is that there's going to be a, a point, uh, there's going to be a fish that's confused about where to go. Okay. This is an amazing theorem. It's, it's actually the basis of some of the most, um, some of the, the, the deepest theorems in, in math. Um, the existence of solutions to nonlinear equations. Newton's method, some of you might have learned in high school. 
actually works because of something like the Brower Fix Point theorem. Like in a neighborhood of a root, this method converges on uh, a root because it's getting mapped in, into itself. Um, here's another famous application of the Brower Fix Point theorem. Um, every game has an equilibrium. So this is a famous theorem in economics. How many people have seen this movie, Beautiful Mind? Okay, John Nash um, is a mathematician who won a Nobel Prize in economics. There isn't a Nobel Prize in math. Um, and he, he won it for this theorem, and basically the theorem is, talk, so what's a game? A game is an interaction between several people, okay? And uh, I'll, I'll explain what equilibrium is. So uh, an equilibrium in a game, is, okay, so an interaction between us is I have a bunch of strategies I'm going to play. Um, you have a bunch of strategies you're going to play. You have a bunch of strategies you're going to play, right? And, and when I approach this interaction, I have to pick a strategy. And then I look at your strategies, and maybe I want, you know, I'm going to play something that's somehow uh, uh, a good response to the strategies I see you playing. So you might imagine then that if you have just two players, rows and column, where Rose plays the rows, and Colin plays the columns. Um, these are the payoffs, right? If Rose plays A and Colin plays alpha, then Colin gets four, oops. Colin gets four and Rose gets three. Are you with me? This is what that matrix represents. Now, wh what's interesting is, <coughs> you might ask, how are you gonna play this game? Well, let's see. If I know that Rose is going to play A, then I'm going to play alpha, because 4 is better than 1 for me. right? But if, if Rose knows that I'm going to play alpha, if Rose knows that Colin's going to play alpha, Rose is probably going to play C. right? So this, there's, this, there's this kind of funny thing that's going on. right? If I know that Colin knows that I know that Colin knows that I know. You know, you could, you could, the problem is in this picture, you don't see any, any place where the best response for col uh, rows and the best response for column line up. Okay? If there was such a place, it'd be called an equilibrium because they are mutual best replies to each other. Okay, so you look at a game like this and you say it doesn't have an equilibrium, and Nash comes along and says, well, guess what? It actually does. But it does if you randomize. That is, Rock, paper, scissors, okay? So rock, paper, scissors is a game that you, you guys maybe know how to play. You know, you, let's see this, ready? Oh, oh, I oh three, three, oh, three, three. One, two, three, go. Okay, so he, he, he beats me because rock kills scissors, right? Okay, let's do it again. Okay. Mm. Ah, he beat me again. Okay, so what's actually happening here? What's his best strategy? Well, his best strategy, which actually turned out to be the same as my best strategy, is to randomize, right? About a third of the time you're playing one or the other, correct? Okay, so what is randomization? Randomization is basically saying, I'm taking some kind of combination of these things, and if you think about the combination that, that Rose is taking, it turns out to be a point in a triangle. And if you think about the, 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 the combination Colin is taking, he's, he's taking something that is basically a point on a line. 100% of the time play alpha, or 50% of the time, or 25% of the time play alpha. Those are all different strategies. Okay. And the, you can think of the product of their strategies as being some kind of bigger prism. Okay? So now I'm, I'm just going to give you, this in, in like just two minutes, the, the sketch of the idea of Nash, which is so amazing. Okay? This is what Nash said. Nash said, gosh, Every interaction is basically uh, a point in a ball, okay? And if there is uh, a better response to what they play, it is actually going to suggest a direction that my choice should move in, okay? And so every, every collection, you're going to realize that you're, the best response to art, to what we're playing, actually points in a certain direction, et cetera. So basically, this is like fish in an aquarium. And the claim by 
by the Brower theorem is that there has to be a point that doesn't move, and that's actually in equilibrium. Beautiful idea. This is a, a three-page paper. This is actual John Nash. Uh, it's a three-page paper. You can look it up with a little bit of analysis. If you take analysis, you can read it. Okay? And um, so many different papers have been written based on the Nash equilibrium. It's such a fundamental concept in game theory, in economics. OK, how is it proved? Using the Brouwer theorem. OK, now what does that do with Sperner's lemma? Sperner's lemma is a very simple way to prove the Brouwer theorem. Okay. And so there's this whole industry actually arose in operations research in the 60s and 70s, basically using Sperner's lemma, a proof of Sperner's lemma we're about to do, to prove theorems that Brouwer can prove, but in a constructive way, okay? Leading to algorithms. Oh, here's another theorem um, that was proved using the Brouwer fixed point theorem. The game of hex cannot end in a draw Surprisingly, using the Brouwer fixed point theorem feels funny, but that's topology and this is common torus. Some interesting interaction here. 1979. Okay, so let's let's prove this. So uh, let's see. There's an odd number. I claim it's an odd number. Okay, so think of this as a house with many rooms. Okay, and here's what I'm going to do. Uh, every one-two edge, I'm going to think of as a door in the house. Are you with me? Rooms. One, two edges are doors. So do you see any doors along this side? No? Do you see any doors along this side? No, there can't be because of the labeling rule, yes? Do you see any doors along the bottom? Yes. How many do you see? Three. In general, if you start at one and end at two, how many do there have to be? There has to be an odd number, right? Because if I move from one to two, I have to flip an odd number of times. Yes? Okay, that's a key point. In fact, that's Sperner's lemma in one dimension. A line is a triangle in one dimension. I labeled one and two. Those are the boundary conditions. Inside, I allow anything. There must be an odd number of one, two edges. Okay, good. And inside, there are doors. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go uh, next to every door in the house and lay down a couple of rocks on one side or the other side of the door. Okay, so if I'm on the inside, I'll put rocks on both sides. But on the boundary, I'll only place one rock. Okay, everybody with me? Okay, so how many rocks are there? Well, I don't know. I'm going to count them. Okay, just tell me if it's even or odd. Odd. Uh, uh, why is there not a number? Every internal door has an even number. Yeah, there's a pair for every internal door, and there's an odd number along the boundary. Are you with me? So there are an odd number of rocks if we count door by door, yes? OK, but now let's count a different way. Let's count room by room. How many rocks can a room have? Can it have none? Yes. Could it have three? Could a room have three rocks? Uh, one, two. But could these both be one, two edges? No, because it's either, if it's a three, then there's only one, correct? If it's a one, there has to be, at most, one other door. Correct? You with me? Can't be two. So, room by room, how many, uh, how many, how many, um, uh, what could be possible? Well, you could either have two, zero, or one rock inside each room, correct? So why do there have to be rocks with only one, with, uh, the only time you get a rock with just, a room with just one rock is the one, two, three triangle, yes? So why do there have to be uh, rooms like this? Because there's an odd number of rocks, right? So at least one room has one rock in it. In fact, there have to be an odd number of rooms with one rock in it. Are you with me? Ah, say ah if you thought it was like that. Okay, here's an even better proof. Not a better proof, a different proof, but maybe even more enlightening. So the second proof is a constructive proof. It says this. Think of this as a house with many rooms, okay? But now I'm, I am a, a burglar, and I'm going to try to, to break into the house and find a one, two, three triangle, okay? 
Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look for a boundary door. And what I'll do is I'll just walk through the door when possible. If this has another door, I move. Or another door, I move. Yes? Now, what could happen? You might end on the boundary. Or you might end in a 1, 2, 3 triangle. Right? 1, 2, 3 triangle is where you'll, have, you'll end because if you, if, if, it only has one door. Are you with me? Okay. So why must there be a 1, 2, 3 triangle? Yeah, good. So do you agree that odd number of boundary doors, but only an even number of them get matched up by paths? So there has to be at least one that's matched up to a 1, 2, 3 triangle. Yes? And if there are any other 1, 2, 3 triangles, they're actually matched up by paths as well. So that's why there's an odd number. Okay? Uh, yes. Okay, how many people like proof 1 better than proof 2? How many people like proof 2 better than proof 1? Okay. Well, I like proof two better than proof one because it actually leads to a constructive way of finding this triangle that isn't just exhaustively searching. Okay. And this is actually what leads to algorithms. Now, just point out that I've just shown you a two-dimensional version of Spur's Law, but there's multi-dimensional versions. Okay. Uh, and you should think about what that looks like. But on a tetrahedron, you break it up into lots of little tetrahedra. You label by Every corner is labeled different. Every edge has one of two labels. Every face is one of three labels. Are you with me? Similar conclusions, similar proofs. You should think about it. Just to provide you a little, little bit of afternoon fun. Um, and uh, the, a similar proof holds. You can follow doors. You just have to decide what the doors are. OK, so uh, what does it have to do with cutting cake fairly? Well, here's a, a, a cool way of thinking about the cake problem. Think about the space of divisions as a geometric space. Now, what do I mean by that? If you ask me to cut the cake by parallel knives, then I can parameterize this space as a set of three numbers, x, y, and z, that add up to, let's say, 1, and are all non-zero. So if you think about a space that's uh, x plus y plus z equals 1, and x, y, and z all non-zero, you begin to realize it looks like a piece of the plane in the first octant with coordinates that look like that. Okay. And what I want you to, to realize then is uh, this is this represents a triangle. Oh, yeah, it's on my slide. Excellent. And every point in this triangle represents a division of k. This is one where the first piece has all the mass. This is one where the second piece has all the mass. Are you with me? And what's a division right here represent? Well, some place where one and two, piece one and two have the mass, but piece three is empty. Are you with me? And any point inside represents some kind of division. Correct? Aha. Uh -huh. OK, good. So space of divisions is a triangle. And now what we're going to do is we're going to triangulate this space, like so. And what I'll do is I'm going to label every, every, every vertex by an owner, Alice, Bob, and Carlos. Okay. And I'll do it in such a way, uh, so however I do it, I'm just going to ask the owner at that piece of the, of, of the, of, at that vertex which piece would you prefer if the cake were cut like this? So no matter who owns this vertex, what are they going to answer if they're hungry? I want piece one. What are they going to answer here if they're hungry? I want piece two. What about along the bottom? I don't know what they're going to answer, but if they're hungry, they'll answer one or two because piece three is empty. Are you with me? And so you'll get a Sperner labeling if you ask people these questions. And so now we'll just be a little clever. If I, if I assign every uh, Alice, Bob, and Carlos uh, uh, vertices in such a way that every triangle is an ABC triangle, I have to figure out how to do that, but if you do it, then if you get a, their answers, that'll be a 1, 2, 3 triangle. Yes, it'll be somewhere. 
And what this means is there is some nearby set of divisions, very nearby set of divisions, where Alice said she wanted piece one, Carlos said he wanted piece two, and Betty said she, he, she wanted piece three. Okay? And uh, so if you pick any point in that simplex, that's a division that's very, very close to approximate and free. Oh, 50. Now what does it say? This says actually then you can find this thing. We know we have an algorithm for finding this thing. So you repeat this for smaller and smaller triangulations. Uh, you could actually get, there are more sophisticated algorithms I haven't told you about that will enable you to get closer and closer and closer to uh, an NV free solution uh, using the compactness of the triangle. Okay, every sequence has a convergent subsequence. Uh, if, you, if you know some analysis, um, you'll be convinced that there's a way to actually converge in even, even closer um, to this point. And that point, there is an MV3 division. Okay, so that's, that's a version of, um, of the cake cutting theorem. If you have hungry players, and what is other assumption we're making is that uh, uh, preferences are not changed by limits. Like if I prefer a, a piece for a limiting set of cuts, I'm still going to prefer it in the limit. Okay, that's the only other assumption I've made. And there has to be an NV free division. And this is um, a versions of this theorem were known. Non-constructive versions have been known since 1947. Constructive versions, of course, the algorithms I mentioned earlier certainly do it. Um, but this is another way of, of sort of getting at it using Sperner's limit. First done by Simmons in 1980. And so when so I was aware of this, and when my friend said to me, "Is there a way to divide the rent?" among us so that there's everybody's happy. I said, oh, hmm, this sounds like the cake cutting problem. But what's different? Instead of looking for the largest piece, you're looking for small pieces. And if you do a similar thing where you look at the space of rent divisions, this is now divisions of rent, then in the corners, you're not going to want piece one. You're going to want what? The free rooms, piece two or piece three. And so what you end up getting is uh, what's known as a dual Sperner labeling, different labeling conditions along the boundary. Uh -huh. And now the natural question is, if you have a dual Sperner labeling, do you have a similar one, two, three condition? Yes? Um, and you, if you think about it, you can think about the proofs, you realize the answer is yes. And so here's a version of, of the rental harmony theorem, as I like to call it. Uh, what conditions are we making? Where assumptions we're making? We're, we're assuming that the house is good in every division of rent. There, uh, every division, some room will be chosen. Um, that's not going to happen if the rent is like a million dollars, right? And every room costs a quarter million. You're not. No one's going to want that house, right? Um, miserly tenants. Nobody passes up a free room. Okay, that's the only other condition. And closed preference preferences, room preferences unchanged by. OK, so um, I'm just going to mention a few things that are probably worth thinking about um, in the uh, interest of time. Um, I, I'll mention the different directions we've taken it. So I had a, a student a few years ago, many years ago now, um, who did a senior thesis trying to, to prove a polytopal version of Sperner's Lemma with very similar labeling conditions. And uh, we did, in fact, prove a, uh, together with Jesus de la Huera, who's a professor at UC Davis, uh, prove a version of Sperner's lemma for polytopes, saying that not, do you, not only do you have a certain number of special triangles, and in this case, special simplices, but you have to have a certain number related to the dimension and the number of vertices of a polytope. Um, if you think about it, I, I, I encourage this as an exercise to think about um, how you would use this to prove the hex theorem, because you can do it. Okay? So that's a little exercise you might have fun with. Uh, and then I'll just mention something very, very recent, a recent result, um, where you can use some of these ideas to actually think about, um, so I'm not going to do this. So here's a very recent kind of direction we've taken it is, what about Sperner's label, uh, multi-labeled Sperner lemma? So here's a Sperner lemma where you have more than one Sperner labeling. One, two, three conditions on blue and red. And you can ask, what are the interactions between these labels? And 
what you notice is that there are, um, there are some interesting interactions, right? You can demand that, for instance, uh, a label, the blue and red each have at least two labels. If you give me any partition of four into two numbers, I can find you uh, conditions on both labelings, uh, a triangle where you have at least a certain number of labels of one kind and the other for the two players. And this actually leads to a, a version of Sperner's lemma for multiple labels. You don't need to follow this, but let me show you what, what the, the, a cool result is. Very recent, it's like last year. Um, let's see. Okay, so here's a new theorem that somebody proved, that a group of people proved. Um, uh, so it turns out that not only, so this is a version where you have n players and one of them doesn't reveal their preferences. So one of them's not in the room when you make that decision. What they, what they proved is there's always a way to divide the rent into n pieces such that when your friend comes back, so you can divide it even not knowing what Alice is going to say. So that when Alice comes back, there will be some division such that everybody's happy. So a little bit of a surprise that you can do that. You can actually keep one. You, you don't need to know the preferences of one player uh, in order to make this division. We saw this theorem. We knew a little bit about, we just proved this multi-labeled Sperner lemma, and we we're like, oh, oh my gosh. This, you know, actually, the proof suggests that there has to be a dual version. So here's a version of, uh, another version of the roommate theorem, rental harmony theorem, which we like to call um, the survivor style roommate theorem. So this is one where, um, it turns out that for any division, uh, for n players, there's always a way to divide the rent into n minus one pieces, so that no matter who gets kicked out at the end of the night, that's the survivor version, everybody can still be made happy. Right. So um, this is, in, in some ways, you can think is exactly dual to uh, the the version that was just proved by this other other group. Okay. Anyways, I hope I've given you some sense of. Um, kinds of interesting things that, uh, that uh, uh, Sparta's Lama can do. It's beautiful theorem because the proofs are beautiful, the applications are actually kind of interesting uh, and important. If you actually want to see how the al algorithm works, you can actually go um, to, let me see if I can find this. There's actually the New York Times did a version of this. So, um, a New York Times reporter called me a few years ago and said, hey, you know, I just came across your work. You know, I had this problem with my roommates. We saw this little applet that no longer actually works, but a student coded this up, a Kyrie Mudd student. He said, we'd like to do, redo the app as a New York Times, you know, interactive. And I was like, whoa, that's great. So I sent them all the code, and they redid it. Um, it took, a, took a year. It was a year, a year after they, he contacted me. He said, it's up. It's, it's online. Uh, and so you can try this. Um, just, just look up uh, Divide Your Rent Fairly or something like that in New York Times. You can actually see Sperner's Lama in practice. Thank you very much. Thank you.